Hello, and welcome to our first ever episode of Memory in a Time of Pandemic. In this series of videos, we talk with the world's leading memory experts about the ways in which the COVID pandemic is shaping our individual and collective remembering and forgetting. What will they personally remember from this time? What insights from their work and their fields will help us to understand memory both during the pandemic and later of the pandemic? Will COVID change the ways in which we're studying memory? This series is sponsored by Memory, Mind and Media, a new interdisciplinary journal launching this year from Cambridge University Press. I'm Amanda Barnier from Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, founding co-editor of the journal alongside my colleague and friend, Andrew Hoskins from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. In this first episode, I'm in conversation with Professor Robin Feibusch from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia in the US. Robin is the director of the Institute for the Liberal Arts at Emory and the Samuel Candle Dobbs Professor of Psychology. She's best known for her research on the social construction of autobiographical memory. She's revealed important relationships among memory, narrative, identity, trauma, and coping. In her book, Family Narratives and the Development of the Autobiographical Self, Robin highlights the crucial role that family conversations about the past for instance, the conversations that take place around dinner tables, plays in the cognitive and emotional development, health and well-being of our children, in fact, all members of our families. Hello, Robin. Hello, Amanda. Thank you so much for, for hosting me today. Yeah, nice to see you. So, Robin, recently you were quoted extensively in a wonderful article in The Atlantic, which was written by Melissa Faye Green, and it's called You Won't Remember the Pandemic the Way You Think You Will. And in that article, Melissa reflects on her own memories of the pandemic, and then she reaches to memory research to try to unpack the kinds of things that are going on. So I thought that you and I do the same sort of thing. So my first question is, um, when did these COVID times start for you? What's your kind of first memorable memory of the pandemic? It's such an interesting question. And I have what, what we as psychologists often call flashbulb memories although we know that now that flashbulb memories may not always be as accurate as we think they are. But I have this very vivid memory of going out with my husband to one of our favorite music venues. It was a Thursday night. Mm. We'd been hearing about the pandemic. We'd have been hearing about COVID and what was gonna happen. It was during our spring break here wow. at Emory. And we came home and I was checking my email late at night when the email came through that we were going remote that the university was closing and we were going remote. And I remember just panicking, thinking here I am, not only my own classes, but having to organize the faculty and the institute and figuring out with everybody else, how do we even do this? Mm. And I remember just sitting there and sending out multiple emails and having multiple email conversations and text conversations. And then it all becomes a blur. Right. I think what's also interesting about that question is that I think most people are going to have that memory of when did my pandemic time start? Exactly. I think it's one of the things that Melissa pointed out in the Atlanta article. And we're seeing that as well. We're now doing um, some research. Um, I'm doing this with my colleagues, Manisha Pasupati and Cecilia mm -hmm. Weinrib at University of Utah. Kate McLean at Western Washington University, Jordan Booker at University of Missouri, and Andrea Fulmer -Green Greenhood at University of Kansas. Mm -hmm. We, as researchers, of course, went right into action yeah. and immediately thought this is really going to seriously affect college students in very, very challenging ways. And we were particularly interested in freshmen, first year mm -hmm. students who are just moving you know, moving out of their parents' home, moving on to campuses, gaining an independent life. So we started a longitudinal study and we asked them, you know, what event do you remember? What impacted you? And at the, just to ask them just a few weeks after the mm -hmm. shutdown, everybody has this memory of hearing the news that the campus was going to close, hearing right. the news that learning was going to go remote. Mm -hmm. Over time, other events begin to color that initial memory, change the way we think about it. But that I do think is going to be one of the things that will mark this as the 
essentially a life period. Right. This is when it started. A kind of the start of the epoch. It's really interesting because you mentioned uh, flashbulb memories and in sort of classic studies of flashbulb events such as you know that 9-11 or the, the the space shuttle challenger blowing up which are two classic studies. I mean a lot of people have those same memories that don't they have when did I hear but those events are discrete and they're happening on sort of one day and Although I guess we could argue that they also usher in a different period, especially in 9-11. But what's different about the pandemic, isn't it? It's been so extended. How do you think it's going to, you know, that sort of ideas about flashbulb memory is going to be similar or different because of the extended nature of this event? I don't, I, it, that's a, it's a great question. And I don't know about the flashbulb memory, how that will change the way we think about that per se, because as you know, and you've been involved in this work yourself, We've already changed our understanding of flashbulb memories to understand that that story becomes a collective shared narrative mm. that kind of takes on a, a canonical narrative form, even though we think it's our own yeah. accurate personal memory. I think what's interesting about the pandemic is that everybody thought, oh, this will be a few weeks. And we kind of settled in for a few weeks. And then it was like, oh, no, it's going to be through the summer. Yes. And then it's going to be, you know, and, and it is true in different parts of the world and in different, you know, in different countries handled it in different ways, mm. different places who are able to control the outbreak and get back to something approaching normalcy. But the world essentially closed down. Yes. And it kept extending in, in ways that were not expected. And I think that changed our emotional rhythm of how we understood what was happening to us. Yeah, I think it'd be quite interesting. John Hopkins University has been tracking sort of uh, COVID outbreaks and COVID data over this entire period. And you can look on their website and they show the sort of first waves, second waves, third waves. And thinking about sort of epochs of memory or lifetime periods, it'd be interesting sometime later to look at the sort of the relationship between the waves of COVID and people's memories, because I think we've had the same experience here, although transmission has been much lower, but everyone I think thought, let's just get through this year and then in the new year, things will be better and we'll be opening up. But we had a, a sort of second or a third wave over Christmas and were closed down in Sydney over Christmas. People weren't allowed to visit again. We were wearing masks. So that idea of sort of these fresh events kind of happening each time seems something interesting, new and different perhaps for memory. Yes, yes, I think that's right. I think the experience in the States is, is a little bit different than that because mm. we never completely opened up. We had moments where things started to open, mm. but a lot of us really were sheltered in place for a really long time. You know, yeah. um, and we, because of that, I also think, what well, you said about a life epic, I think exactly that. This will be remembered as during COVID right? Mm -hmm. It will be a life period. I think what's going to be really interesting is how people who are at different stages in their life journey will kind of mark the pandemic period. Right. You know, I was in high school. I was a college freshman. You know, I was a college senior and I couldn't walk, you know, to, to my graduation. Yeah. You know, I, I had been planning to get married. I had a child. And I mean, the interview that Melissa Faye Green talks about in her mm -hmm. article, with this woman who was having, you know, really a very difficult pregnancy and gave birth during the pandemic while her husband was in. So, you know, and then my sense is as an older person, you know, kind of where it fits into my life trajectory, I think all of us will have this, oh yes, during, during the COVID times, yeah. I remember X, but I think it will impact our life narrative in different ways. Yeah, that's so fascinating because you've written a lot, haven't you, about sort of master narratives and in particular the influence perhaps in the US and in other cultures as well about a sort of a redemptive narrative of sort mm. of you know, hard times, struggled through, but we've come out of it in the end. Do you think uh, that that master narrative will play itself out in these ways or that it will be nuanced over time depending on how people actually have survived? I think it's, I'm already seeing the redemption narratives. Mm. I'm seeing it among my students who have already talking about as much as they, you know, did not like certain things about being 
you know, uh, it being in a remote learning environment, that they missed this, they missed being on campus, or they missed being with their friends. There's always this kind of but that a lot of them put on it. Mm. But, but I've gotten closer to my family. Yeah. But I've learned to be more self-reflective. Mm. But I've really been thinking so much more about what my values are. I've, you know, so there's... I think, and I don't know how much of this is Western or American, but there is this need almost to say something good has to come out of this. Otherwise, you know, how do we make any sense out of it? No, exactly. There's a colleague here at Macquarie University, Monique Crane, who's been doing work on how we reflect on past events and how the more we can have a reflective sort of style rather than a ruminative style in thinking about past events, then that can really support our building of resilience. And so, you know, our ability to then to confront these challenges going forward. Um, you, I, I want to like, just add to that because in the study that I was just talking about that we're doing tracking for students who were freshmen mm. um, when the pandemic hit and they're now in their second year and we're following them through, hopefully we'll follow them through their college careers. But the ones who were able to um, express more personal growth in their narratives mm. are now showing higher levels of resilience, mental health, and feelings of academic competence. Yes. So there's something very meaningful about being able to create this kind of growth story. Of course, we don't know yet direction of causality right. we may be able to map that out with these yeah. longitudinal data yes and i guess there will be you know obviously lots of people who for them no amount of sort of reflecting or resilience is actually going to overcome for you know really significant concrete challenges of losing family members of losing right. jobs of you know uh, losing important parts of their life so which reflects how different this experience has been even though we're all in the pandemic all across our countries, all across the world, it's still different, isn't it, for different people? Absolutely. I think that's that's a really critical point. There are people who have suffered much, much more tragedy under the pandemic than, than others. We were just saying earlier how I feel like I've been very fortunate. This, of course, is also a redemption narrative. I was lucky. Yeah. I had this level of privilege in my job, in my home, mm. my finances, in my family, whatever it is, right, that that we do this kind of social comparison. Mm. But I think that even for those who suffer great loss, and maybe even more so for those who suffer great mm. loss, the need to find some redemptive meaning in that loss may be very great. Yeah, yeah. And something that I guess, you know, I was going to ask you, how do you think this will change the way that we're studying memory? And, and what you're saying really highlights the need to follow people over time. And you mentioned the importance of longitudinal uh, sort of studies. Are there other ways in which you think that the, our, our typical approach to, to studying memory might be nuanced by the kind of event we're living through and the fact that it's sort of everywhere but not exactly the same and across all generations? I think a couple of things, some more technical about the way we study memory. I think that too many of us often study autobiographical memory as specific punctuated episodes you know, that's the gold standard, mm. the, the afternoon that of my 16th birthday party. Right. Um, I think what the pandemic has highlighted for us is that much of our memory is undifferentiated time mm. and is just yeah. kind of memory of routines. It's like, I think our memories of the pandemic are going to be more like, well, during the pandemic, I cooked dinner more often, Right. Yeah. you know, but not... And there may be a memorable dinner or two within that, but that we're gonna, I think it highlights how much of our memory is that are these recurring events, mm. routine events, extended events, and that the gold standard of that specific episode may not be the way we actually organize our memories. The yeah, other thing exactly that right. I've noticed, and, and I've talked with a lot of people about this, how critical place is to our memories. Mm -hmm. So for those of us who have really been in, under lockdown for a year, uh, again, I was joking to you earlier, this is my home office. Mm -hmm. I have been in this chair at this computer virtually every day for the last year. Yeah. Right. There's like, there's no distinction of place anymore. I don't move from my office to the classroom, to a meeting, 
to a conference, you know, you know wherever it is, even out to dinner with friends. Mm. You know, we go out for walks. We certainly do socially distanced, you know, visits, you know, things like that. But yeah. it's, it's, we're spending so much time in a single place. And I think that's one of the reasons it's so hard for us to even differentiate specific episodes. Yeah, because it's some it's the interaction sort of between context and transitions, isn't it? Sort of yes. the fact that it's not just uh, in a certain context, but that we're moving between them at different parts of the day. Because I, I was, you know, reflecting on what you say, I don't even know that I have a specific memory of when the pandemic happened for me, except for a really memorable event when I, you know, with a colleague and. Um, and he said to me, you know, our vice chancellor said that the pair of us shouldn't be in the room together at the moment because in case we both get sick and, you know, as though we like we're not the president and the vice president or something or the, you know. So yeah. I thought that is a really weird thing to say. Does he think, you know, we'll all, the, you know, nobody will be here to run the university if, if we all get sick. And I thought that was such a weird thing. I would never have expected to hear. It. And that's my third sort of first memory. And then I can't really differentiate one day from another when we were sent home and we were working for home, except that it was mm -hmm. one big muddy long period of sort of sitting exactly. at this too small desk and trying to get my daughter to you know to homeschool and things like that and hard very hard uh to differentiate yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you spoke a bit earlier about sort of uh how you think different different generations of people might reflect on their experiences and a lot of your work has been about the sort of intergenerational sharing learning mm -hmm. of lessons and how it, you've uh reflected in your work of how critical it is for say grandchildren to know the stories of their parents and their grandparents and how much psychological benefit that brings what sort of stories do you think you know grandparents parents will be telling their kids in another 20 years I've thought about this a lot and I've thought about this kind of in historical context and it's interesting there are very very few family stories around previous pandemics right like the last uh the 1918 influenza mm -hmm. pandemic families were greatly affected by that obviously i mean yeah. the death rates were astronomical but there aren't a lot of family stories that are passed down around that mm. and i'm trying to think about why that might be and whether this will be the same yes um and then i think about other kinds of things like you know stories of world war ii you know yeah. and which is also an extended event Yes. you know punctu punctuated obviously by very very significant events um those were passed down in a different kind of way mm. Mm. or stories of like the civil rights movement in the u.s yeah. uh yeah i don't know it's those do get passed down but somehow yeah. we don't have intergenerational stories of pandemics I wonder if it's, is, is it the confluence of a couple of events? Because, of course, the 1918 um, pandemic came right on the heels of the end of First World War. So, yes. you know, whether it was sort of, you know, something about exhaustion, I don't know. So it would be interesting to think there's been so many monumental things happening around the same time here in Australia. We had sort of terrible, devastating bushfires literally a month or two before the pandemic hit. And, of course, in the US, you've had the Black Lives you know, movement and some really consequential things. So it would be interesting to know whether when these sort of big monumental events are all colliding, will that change uh, what we remember as opposed to if it's something sort of quite distinct? Mm -hmm. It reminds me of Norman Brown's work about living in history, um, of how we remember our individual autobiographical memories in the context of a you know, historical moment. But here, maybe multiple things are happening at the same time. I, very much so. So I think it's, I don't think we know how these stories will get passed down or if there's stories. And there's a sense in which I don't think we know exactly what the story is going to be yet. Yeah. I mean, there is, of course, at least what's emerging in the U.S. among many people, not everybody, but among many people, the triumph of science. Mm. Who would have thought that a year ago, we would have been able to develop a vaccine that's so effective so quickly. Yes. Um, but that's a different kind of cultural narrative. 
Mm. Um, that's not so much an individual family narrative. Yeah, so it's sort of, you know, we we hear a lot about the functions of memory, don't we? And sort of that idea about learning lessons and passing on, you know, information. Do you think there'll be other lessons we'll, we'll take from this time? I mean, uh, we've all been in our homes, I guess maybe will we appreciate more, you know, being able to be connected again and that might change the way in which we're sort of sharing memories, getting connected, being, I worry for instance about sort of lack of connection for our older adults and uh, in Australia and I presume also uh, where you are that you know families couldn't visit their loved ones in in aged care settings obviously for good reasons to keep them safe but that sort of lack of connection that yes. pulling apart of bonds um, has, has I think been really consequential. I agree and along with that is the lack of two things I think one is physical contact I think one of the things that's really coming out we always knew this. We always knew this in psychology and physiology and biology, the importance of human touch yeah. for our own well being and our emotional and physiological regulation. But I think we really, each of us now really understands in an embodied way how important hugging somebody else is. Exactly. Yeah. I think a lot of people remember, you know, when was their last hug? I mean, here in Australia, we've been, well, we have been hugging people. I mean, I think we've been able to, but I, I think some people might have quite vivid memories of when their last, you know, human contact actually was, especially for those living alone. Yes, exactly. I, yeah. I think that that's really, I think that is really an important, an important part of it. Mm -hmm. I also think what we're learning is, in addition to the physical touch, how important in-person interaction, just that everyday inconsequential chit chat, you know, that you just engage in on a regular basis, how important that is to weave our lives together, to make us feel like we're a part of a community, um, you know, and you just don't get the same thing over Zoom. We we had a we had an in person faculty meeting recently, the first one yeah. in over a year. We're a relatively small group, six people, we're all vaccinated. We're in the room. Yeah. And we're looking at each other. And we're saying we don't know how to chat anymore. <laughs> <laughs> exactly but I do wonder if there'll be also again we've talked about generational effects like my children who are sort of in high school are really digital natives and you know mm. sometimes they prefer I say why don't you call that person and they're chatting chatting on the text like no why would I call them that I, I that I wonder again whether the, the the differences in sort of the impacts on them and how they think about it and how they're you know developing their stories about it are really influenced by the kind of people that they are now and how I say they are with this sort of communication or this sort of storytelling that's quite a bit different from us. It certainly feels different to me. I think that's right. I think that's right. And I think that as we move forward, there's likely to be more digital interaction. Yeah. Uh, I mean, whoever thought we could do as much as we do oh, on Zoom or on texting or whatever the platform. Yeah. But I think what we've also learned is it will never replace the human interaction. Yeah, no, I agree. So let me ask you a slightly different question, but about media again. So sort of what, what images stand out for, for you from, from this time, whether you're, you know, things you've personally seen or experienced or images from the media? You know, I, it, it's, hard, it's hard to say. I think images for me that, were, that remain sort of haunting are more of the political images mm. that have occurred during the pandemic, um, the events that sparked the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, mm. for example. Mm. I mean, those are haunting and yeah. horrific. Yeah. But I also remember images early on when New York City was very hard hit. And I grew up in New York, so I always have this, yes. you know, very close connection. And the streets were just empty. And yeah. it, just with seeing that, it felt eerie, like apocalyptic. Exactly. That the streets of New York were empty. Yes. Yes. No, I absolutely agree. And, you know, and I remember early on, before Australia was particularly, uh, it was never as badly hit, but um, but those images of sort of refrigerated trucks and, and of digging 
uh, graves in places you would never expect to see them and the fact no one's on the street. Um, and, and it does signal something quite different, doesn't it? In, 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 especially as you look around the world. I mean, and I found that the most sort of moving thing to see. We're all going through something quite similar, but to see those experiences elsewhere, um, I think it's been really powerful. How else have you, what else have you noticed about how the media has sort of been shaping? Obviously, you've also been through a presidential election during this period as well. I mean, how do you think the media has been, what have you noticed about the media sort of shaping narratives or sort of memories of COVID during this period? I think in several ways. I mean, obviously, and now we're talking about, you know, media that, that, that is uh, uh, motivated by uh, economic, you know, to make money, to sell, right? Um, so, you know, newspapers, magazines. Uh, I mean, I think that there are several kinds of interrelated kind of COVID media stories. Mm -hmm. One, some positive, like the return to home cooking and, you know, how families are coming back together around the dinner table and cooking. And I do have to say that I think there's some validity to that. But if you actually look at the data, at least in the U.S., most families actually ate dinner together every night before the pandemic. Right. Okay. You know, they did, maybe they did more takeout. Maybe they did more going out to the pizzeria. But, you know, they were eating dinner together. But you would, to hear the media story, you would think mm -hmm. families just weren't eating dinner together. And now they are. <laughs> right, right. Um, so I think that is interesting. And the resurgence of cooking and gardening and... Yeah. And I think there is some truth to that. I mean, I, I do think that that is, those are activities that people have increased during the, during the pandemic mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. Um, but then there are also, I think, um, some of the negative stories, uh, the, the conspiracy theory stories, yeah. the, yeah. the anti-science, anti-vaxxer stories, at least in the U.S., mm -hmm. that have really... They play well in the media, yes. and I don't think that they're particularly helpful or productive. Yeah, it'll be really interesting, I think, to see, you know, when we're through this, what people will remember and whether it will be those dominant narratives, those sort of yeah. you know, conspiracy ideas that prevail or whether, you know, when we've hopefully successfully navigated and here in Australia, it's been very interesting to see sometimes how the media has been out of step with uh, the community sentiment. So for instance, when they've criticized government for introducing masks and, and then, you know, the community seems to say, no, no, we want this and we're comfortable with it. And, and we agree with the leaders about this and sort of this sort of negotiation in a way um, has been really interesting, interesting to witness and then them sort of leading in other areas. So it's interesting. Here's my final question for you, Robin, to, to think about what has made the deepest impression on you so far about the pandemic? What do you think that you personally will remember most from this time? I, I think for me, as somebody who's older and has been in a university setting for several decades and has um, been very very dedicated to my undergraduate teaching in a lot of ways and to the undergraduate experience. I think for me, what I realized is how much I get from my undergraduates when I teach in person mm -hmm. and how much I do not get that same satisfaction from them. And for me, that tells me, we will, you know, everybody says, oh, the world is going to change. We'll be doing Zoom conferences and Zoom classes, online this, and, um, and I'm like, no, we won't. Mm. we won't, because we need that social interaction. Yes. We need other people. And I'm somebody who always, oh, has always enjoyed time by myself, mm. time alone, and I will continue to do so. Um, but I think this is underscored for me, even for those of us who are maybe a little bit more on the introverted side of things or liking social isolation a little bit more than others. That's not who we're meant to be as human beings. Yeah, exactly. And, the, you know, and our memories and our storytelling and our sharing of things is really the sort of, you know, the grease for the wheels, isn't it, between us all and that, that sort of 
inability to do it so smoothly and you know moment to moment is it's really been challenging yeah the stories connect us the Sorry. stories keep us connected in a very very deep sense because when we share our experiences we're sharing who we are yes and when we listen to other people's stories we're listening to who they are yeah and that changes both of us in that mm -hmm. interaction so do you think we'll be different people either you and i or just more generally post pandemic than we were before better <laughs> mm. more we're always people. different people <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I just, I, know, I just don't know in specifically what way no exactly so we'll have to wait and see and all i can do is look forward to the time robin that we get to be together in a room again and, and we can be very fun. about memory but thank you so much for joining me today and for talking about memory it's been lovely i'm happy to do it always wonderful to talk with you amanda thank you thanks so much robin bye-bye